Welcome to the Rosenbach Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Ames, the Rosenbach's Collections Engagement Manager, and I'm pleased to introduce Season 1, Books and Bitters, Adventures in Book Collecting, in which we explore the stories behind fascinating objects in the Rosenbach's collection and engage in critical conversations about the place of rare books, libraries, and museums in modern-day life. In this episode, I'll introduce myself and tell you more about the Rosenbach's remarkable collections by highlighting a few of my favorite pieces in our library. I'll also tell you what you can expect as Season 1 unfolds. I'm so glad you've decided to tune in to the Rosenbach podcast. The fact that you hit play on this episode tells me a number of things about you. I bet you love books, history, and literature. I bet you love exploring historic places and discovering new things. And I bet that, like me, you find inspiration in great stories, artworks, and mysterious places. One place where all of these things come together is the Rosenbach, an historic house museum and special collections library tucked into an idyllic, tree-lined residential street near Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia. It's easy to meander past the Rosenbach on a walk down Delancey Place without noticing it, but if you step inside, you'll find a beautiful historic house, furnished with antique furniture and iconic early American paintings, as well as one of the world's most distinguished libraries of rare books and manuscripts. In the coming episodes of the Rosenbach podcast, we'll journey behind the scenes to learn how the institution developed into the treasure that it is today, and what stories reside on its bookshelves. First, however, I want to take some time to introduce myself to you, seeing as I'll be your guide throughout the podcast as we meet some of my colleagues here at the Rosenbach and at other institutions to think about the place of libraries and museums in modern life. Most of us at the Rosenbach have a story about how we ended up here and what we love most about the place. I'd like to kick off the podcast by sharing my stories with you. I first found myself on the Rosenbach's doorstep back in January 2014, the first day of my internship in the Collections Department. At the Rosenbach and many other museums, Collections Departments serve as stewards of the organization's collections, taking care of them, preserving them for future generations, studying them, and sharing them with the public. Seeing as I aspired to a career in curatorial work focused on rare books and manuscripts, needless to say the opportunity to spend time at the Rosenbach with its collection of more than 400,000 rare books, manuscripts, archival records, and artworks was a dream come true. As I learned more about the institution and spent time working with collections in the historic houses period spaces, one of the things that struck me most is how the various collections objects connect to, contextualize, and inform one another. Dr. A.S.W. Rosenbach and his brother Philip, who lived in the historic house and established the museum and library in 1954, were expert collectors, so it's little surprise that so many connections emerge from the objects on view in the house. When I stand in Dr. Rosenbach's library, which is filled with treasures of American history, Judaica, continental European literature, early printed works, and the literature of the British Isles, I imagine the authors and characters of the various books talking to one another, and what a rich conversation it would be. My imagination is always sparked as I journey through the bookshelves, and I always, always discover something new. Recently, a voyage among the bookshelves in the library took me to the Scottish Highlands and sparked my imagination in a way that brings together all of my interests. I'd love to tell you about it. In the process, I hope you'll get a sense of how I go about my work here at the Rosenbach. For this story to make any sense, you need to know that there are two things I love as much as rare books. Drinking tea and playing the harp, which is a traditional instrument of the Celtic peoples of Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, Brittany, and other regions. 
The autumn and winter, in particular, frequently find me baking scones to share with friends over a cup of tea and plucking away at the harp as the weather outside grows colder and grayer. I imagine a chilly wind picking up the sound of my instrument and carrying my music on its wings. On the occasions when my three main interests of books, harp, and tea come together in my life, well, I'm in heaven. This happened recently in a way that I couldn't have foreseen, except if you remember that our collections at the Rosenbach have a way of conversing with one another if one pays enough attention to listen. Recently, when unlocking one of our creaky old bookcases in the library, a set of materials I had never spent much time looking at before caught my eye. The first editions of the novels of Sir Walter Scott, the great Scottish writer who was one of the most widely read authors in Great Britain in the 1800s, and whose historical fiction, prose, and poetry helped spark a renewal of Scottish nationalism. I hadn't even realized that we held such a large collection of Scott's works, though I wasn't surprised, given his importance in British cultural history. While an iconic Scottish author to this day, I think it's fair to say that Scott's works are not as widely read as they once were. The Rosenbach's world-renowned collection of the works of Robert Burns, Scotland's national poet, lives across the library from the Walter Scott collection, and those materials are well used in our programs, especially on Burns Night every January. But I couldn't ever recall having seen these books by Scott pulled off the shelves in recent times. A part of me believes that books have feelings, so I decided to take it upon myself to spend some time with Sir Walter. Little did I know that before long I would find myself in a Celtic world where tea, harp, and books intertwine. As it turns out, years ago I had purchased a 19th century edition of Scott's Waverly novels for my own personal library. So when I got home from the Rosenbach that night, I pulled out volume one of the set and started reading the novel Waverly, which was a fantastic hit during Scott's lifetime and helped ignite a new era of Scottish patriotism. In the historical novel, a fictional young English gentleman soldier named Captain Edward Waverley becomes entwined in the cause of Scotland's Bonnie Prince Charlie, the real-life Roman Catholic pretender to the throne, representing the House of Stuart, and thus the enemy of the House of Hanover that occupied the joint throne of England and Scotland. Waverley has all sorts of adventures in the Scottish Highlands and beyond. A handsome young man of high birth and great fortune, not to mention heir to a sizable estate, Edward unsurprisingly encounters love interests along his way. These include Lady Rose, the charming daughter of a genteel baron from the Scottish lowlands, and Flora, an aristocratic highlands maiden who ardently supports Bonnie Prince Charlie and whose wild beauty and Celtic charms enthrall the romantic young Edward. I'll let you read the novel to learn which of these young women eventually marries our protagonist. As Sir Walter Scott portrays in the novel, during this time of political uncertainty in Great Britain, to be Celtic meant to be both culturally different from the English and perhaps even a threat to the established government in London, a sense of otherness that shapes how Scott presents his characters. The part of the story that really captured my attention is when Edward, on a trip to the Wild Highlands, meets Flora at her tea table. Her brother Fergus, the clan's leader and a great warrior, had escorted Edward to his sister's repast with a request that she translate some Scottish court poetry from the original Gaelic into English for Edward's benefit. Quote, My dear Flora, Fergus announces, I must tell you that Captain Waverley is a worshipper of the Celtic muse, not the less so, perhaps, that he does not understand a word of her language. Will you have the goodness to read or recite to our guest in English the extraordinary string of names which McMurrow, a court bard, 
has tacked together in Gaelic? At first, Flora is hesitant. Quote, you know how little these verses can possibly interest an English stranger, even if I could translate them as you pretend. Flora eventually agrees and provides Edward Waverley with an introduction to the rudiments of Celtic verse. Quote, the recitation, she said, of poems recording the feats of heroes, the complaints of lovers, and the wars of contending tribes forms the chief amusement of a winter fireside in the Highlands. Some of these are said to be very ancient, and if they are ever translated into any of the languages of civilized Europe, cannot fail to produce a deep and general sensation. It is impossible to gratify your curiosity, Captain Waverley, without exposing my own presumption. If you will give me a few moments for consideration, I will endeavor to engraft the meaning of these lines upon a rude English translation, which I have attempted of a part of the original. The duties of the tea table seem to be concluded, and, as the evening is delightful, Una, one of Flora's attendants, will show you the way to one of my favorite haunts, and Kathleen and I will join you there. This is where the story gets particularly interesting from my perspective. Sir Walter Scott uses the Highlands landscape and the sound of the harp to enhance Flora's feminine charms as viewed through Edward's eyes. Her musical abilities underscore her gentility and artistic sensibilities, and they also link her to the evocative atmospheric environment all around her. Sir Walter Scott, in effect, subjects Flora to the erotic gaze of a member of the opposite sex, who was also a native of a different land. Let's pick up the story. Quote, Una, having received instructions in her native language, conducted Waverley out by a passage different from that through which he had entered the apartment. At a distance he heard the hall of the chief still resounding with the clang of bagpipes and the high applause of his guests. Having gained the open air by a postern door, they walked a little way up the wild, bleak, and narrow valley in which the house was situated, following the course of the stream that winded through it. In a spot about a quarter of a mile from the castle, two brooks which formed the little river had their junction. The larger of the two came down the long, bare valley, which extended apparently without any change or elevation of character, as far as the hills which formed its boundary permitted the eye to reach. But the other stream, which had its source among the mountains on the left hand of the strath, seemed to issue from a very narrow and dark opening betwixt two large rocks. These streams were different also in character. The larger was placid and even sullen in its course, wheeling in deep eddies or sleeping in dark blue pools. But the motions of the lesser brook were rapid and furious, issuing from between precipices, like a maniac from his confinement, all foam and uproar. It was up the course of this last stream that Waverley, like a knight of romance, was conducted by the fair highland damsel, his silent guide. A small path, which had been rendered easy in many places for Flora's accommodation, led him through scenery of a very different description from that which he had just quitted. This narrow glen, at so short a distance, seemed to open into the land of romance. The rocks assumed a thousand peculiar and varied forms. In one place, a crag of huge size presented its gigantic bulk, as if to forbid the passenger's farther progress and it was not until he approached its very base that Waverley discerned the sudden and acute turn by which the pathway wheeled its course around this formidable obstacle. In another spot, the projecting rocks from the opposite sides of the chasm had approached so near to each other that two pine trees laid across and covered with turf formed a rustic bridge. While gazing at this pass of peril, which crossed, like a single black line, the small portion of blue sky not intercepted by the projecting rocks on either side, it was with a sensation of horror that Waverley beheld Flora and her attendant appear, like inhabitants of another region, propped, as it were, in mid-air, upon this trembling structure. She stopped upon observing him below, and, with an air of graceful ease which made him shudder, waved her handkerchief to him by way of signal. He was unable, from the sense of dizziness which her situation conveyed, to return the salute, 
and was never more relieved than when the fair apparition passed on from the precarious eminence which she seemed to occupy with so much indifference, and disappeared on the other side. Here Waverley found Flora gazing on the waterfall. Two paces farther back stood Kathleen, holding a small Scottish harp, the use of which had been taught to Flora by Rory Dahl, one of the last harpers of the Western Highlands. The sun, now stooping in the west, gave a rich and varied tinge to all the objects which surrounded Waverley, and seemed to add more than human brilliancy to the full expressive darkness of Flora's eye, exalted the richness and purity of her complexion, and enhanced the dignity and grace of her beautiful form. Edward thought he had never, even in his wildest dreams, imagined a figure of such exquisite and interesting loveliness. The wild beauty of the retreat, bursting upon him as if by magic, augmented the mingled feeling of delight and awe with which he approached her, like a fair enchantress of Boyardo or Ariosto, by whose nod the scenery around seemed to have been created an Eden in the wilderness. Flora, like every beautiful woman, was conscious of her own power, and pleased with its effects, which she could easily discern from the respectful yet confused dress of the young soldier. But as she possessed excellent sense, she gave the romance of the scene and other accidental circumstances full weight in appreciating the feelings with which Waverley seemed obviously to be impressed, and, unacquainted with the fanciful and susceptible peculiarities of his character, considered his homage as the passing tribute which a woman of even inferior charms might have expected in such a situation. She therefore quietly led the way to a spot at such a distance from the cascade that its sound should rather accompany than interrupt that of her voice and instrument, and, sitting down upon a mossy fragment of rock, she took the harp from Kathleen. I have given you the trouble of walking to this spot, Captain Waverley, both because I thought the scenery would interest you, and because a highland song would suffer still more from my imperfect translation, were I to introduce it without its own wild and appropriate accompaniments. To speak in the poetical language of my country, the seat of the Celtic muse is in the mist of the secret and solitary hill, and her voice in the murmur of the mountain stream. He who woos her must love the barren rock more than the fertile valley, and the solitude of the desert better than the festivity of the hall. Few could have heard this lovely woman make this declaration with a voice where harmony was exalted by pathos, without exclaiming that the muse whom she invoked could never find a more appropriate representative. But Waverley, though the thought rushed on his mind, found no courage to utter it. Indeed, the wild feeling of romantic delight with which he heard the first few notes she drew from her instrument amounted almost to a sense of pain. He would not for worlds have quitted his place by her side, yet he almost longed for solitude, that he might decipher and examine at leisure the complication of emotions which now agitated his bosom. It's clear that Sir Walter Scott, whose female characters regularly assume an objectified domestic role in his fiction writings, has used the wild Highlands landscape to imply Flora's sensual qualities, which utterly overtake Captain Edward Waverley as he falls in love with this Eden in the Highlands and its female occupant. The line between danger and pleasure is intentionally thin in Scott's prose, as Edward Waverley climbs toward his Celtic muse in the distance. The harp becomes an instrument of cajolery, the ultimate expression both of Flora's genteel accomplishment and her Celticness, ensnaring Edward in its sounds. This is certainly one way to view the harp. And yet it's important to remember that Flora and her attractive qualities are constructions of Sir Walter Scott's ideal of feminine beauty, not historical fact, and certainly not the only way to interpret the harp or the highlands. <laughs> 
Though Scott claims that Flora embraced her female power of attraction, I'm left with the distinct feeling upon reading this passage that Flora, at least in this scene of the novel, is a man's pastiche of an attractive Highlands woman. It's like she was constructed by Scott solely so that she can be subjected to Edward Waverley's male gaze. Do you remember what I mentioned earlier about how collections at the Rosenbach speak to one another? Well, as I examined the Rosenbach's first edition of Waverly in our library's reading room, I heard another little book calling out to me, offering a very different perspective on class, gender, agency, and the magical power of the Celtic harp. It's a small book that lives in our American literature collection, a poem by the 20th century American poet Edna St. Vincent Millay, titled the Ballad of the Harp Weaver. This poem, whose protagonist is a female harp player and whose author is a woman, presents harp in a very different perspective. The poem takes us into the cottage of a young, poor, widowed mother and her son as a cold winter sets in. The mother grieves because she cannot afford to purchase supplies to make her son warm clothes for the winter. The poem is narrated from the perspective of the little boy. Whereas Captain Edward Waverley's gaze was one of romantic excitement, the little boy's gaze, as constructed by Malay, is one of admiration for a mother who claimed what little power she had to keep her son safe and warm. In The Ballad of the Harp Weaver, the harp takes on truly magical qualities. On Christmas Eve, as the little boy lies in bed, his mother sits down at the harp and begins to play. But something is different this night. The harp transforms into a loom, and as the woman plays, her fingers weave new clothes for her son. The miracle incurs a tragic cost. Let me read a selection from the poem to you. The night before Christmas, I cried with the cold, I cried myself to sleep like a two-year-old. And in the deep night, I felt my mother rise and stare down upon me with love in her eyes. I saw my mother sitting on the one good chair, a light falling on her from I couldn't tell where, looking nineteen and not a day older, and the harp with a woman's head leaned against her shoulder her thin fingers moving in the thin tall strings were weave weave weaving wonderful things many bright threads from where i couldn't see were running through the harp strings rapidly and gold threads whistling through my mother's hand i saw the web grow and the pattern expand she wove a child's jacket and when it was done she laid it on the floor and wove another one she wove a red cloak so regal to see she's made it for a king's son i said and not for me but i knew it was for me she wove a pair of breeches quicker than that she wove a pair of boots and a little cocked hat she wove a pair of mittens she wove a little blouse she wove all night in the still cold house she sang as she worked and the harp string spoke her voice never faltered, and the thread never broke. And when I awoke, there sat my mother, with the harp against her shoulder, looking nineteen and not a day older. A smile about her lips, and a light about her head, and her hands in the harp strings, frozen, dead. And piled up beside her, and toppling to the skies, were the clothes of a king's son, just my size. Mm -hmm. 
In Edna St. Vincent Millay's poem, the harp becomes a practical tool by which a young woman claims great power, drawing on help from heaven to aid someone whom she loved. The ballad of the harp weaver weaves a tale both tragic and triumphant. The fact that the harp has a woman's head carved into it is Millay's brilliant metaphor for the challenges women face in a culture that prioritizes men's labor and glorifies men's work over the economic and social contributions of women, especially mothers. Yet, using the means she has at her disposal, the harp weaver achieves her goal. The Christmas Eve setting hearkens to a Christian heritage of divine intervention, sacrifice, family, and a child's promise. It's the perfect setting to celebrate a mother's generosity. The poem is a sharp, moving commentary on class, gender, family, motherhood, and the nature of work. As the United States wrestles with the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic and the dangers of income inequality shape our national discourse, Malay's words ring in my ears as a timeless reminder of the cost of poverty and the power of a parent's love. These two books that reside in the Rosenbach's library speak to each other, and they speak to me. Though written long ago, both works of literature feel timely and relevant to me personally and to our society, a society which continues to confront fraught questions of gender, labor, the boundaries of healthy relationships, and the personal toll of inequality. These books are just two artifacts of the more than 400,000 that line the Rosenbach's library shelves, fill our historic house, and rest safely under lock and key in our storage rooms. Each object calls out to me, and I know that as you continue listening to this podcast and visit us on site, they will to you as well. Thank you for listening to the Rosenbach Podcast. Check back soon for another glimpse into the Rosenbach's remarkable collection of rare books, manuscripts, art, and artifacts, and for more fascinating conversations about history, literature, and culture. As Season 1 episodes are released during the winter months ahead, I hope that you make a cup of tea, curl up by your fireside, and enjoy learning more about the Rosenbach and its collections. In the next three installments, I'll chat with some of my valued colleagues and mentors here at the museum who can help us learn more about the work of the institution and the makeup of our collections. In the coming weeks, we'll unveil ten other installments that dive deep into the Rosenbach collections and reveal remarkable stories about the life and times of our founders, Dr. A.S.W. Rosenbach and his brother Philip, as well as other aspects of the book arts and book collecting. I hope you tune in. Interested in baking some scones to enhance your listening experience? Visit rosenbach.org slash podcast to find links to some of my favorite recipes. To learn more about the Rosenbach, visit rosenbach.org. We host a variety of on-site and online events and public programs, and always welcome questions from listeners about how to use our collections. Our holdings are always accessible to researchers who make a free appointment to visit our reading room. The Rosenbach's community reaches all around the globe, brought together by our love for history, rare books, manuscripts, and the arts. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach and this podcast by becoming a member today. It's one of the best ways to help us with projects like this. Memberships start at just $55 and give you access to everything we have to offer, online and in person. Thank you for your support. <laughs>
If you enjoy the introductory and concluding music featured on the podcast, which was composed and performed by Rosenbach Board of Directors member Yolanda Wisher and her band The Afro Leaders, and was recorded at WRTI 90.1 in Philadelphia for NPR Live Sessions, visit WRTI.org to learn more. Also, please consider purchasing Yolanda Wisher's new album. Just visit Rosenbach.org for information. This episode's harp selections were performed by me, Alex Ames. The Rosenbach Podcast is supported by a grant from the Evelyn Toll Family Foundation. Thanks again, and I look forward to continuing our conversation on the next episode of the Rosenbach Podcast. Trust fund in the 215